Nicole, you there? I'm here. Hi there. Good uh, evening, everyone. Thank you, Nicole, for uh, tuning in and being our guest for tonight, as well as Brad Stanley. And he works uh, along with you. Is that correct, Nicole? Uh, it's Brad Snyder, and he is actually a member of my kitchen cabinet on anti-bullying. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, no problem. And uh, I, met, uh, I met you, Nicole, a couple of months back uh, during the situation that occurred uh, with me in, in uh, Phoenix. And it was uh, definitely such an honor to be able to meet someone who uh, is rallying up against individuals who are being pushed around, being bullied. And um, it seems to be one of those things that, even though we know about it, it continues to be amongst us, almost like, you know, almost like an illness. Right. I, I think that's true. And, you know, my, my colleague Brad, who is on the phone, uh, through his research, we've, we've, you know, revealed that bullying has been around for a long time. It's not something that's new, and it's probably something that many people have experienced in the course of their lifetime or that they know someone who has experienced it. But it's also not getting worse. It's something that's been around for a long time, but, you know, even though the media is paying more attention to it, it's not something that's getting worse, but it is something that is very serious. And uh, that's why I wanted to take it on as an initiative that I would be working on during the time that my husband is mayor of Phoenix. I find that so um, amazing that you're taking that up because a lot of people would be afraid to take something like that and, and go um, full on with that. Have you um, come across of, of a lot of resistance? No, I would say I, I, haven't, I haven't come a lot across a lot of resistance. I've actually, just to the contrary, I've had a lot of people a lot of parents reach out to me, a lot of students reach out, and um, I've heard a lot of their stories. Um, it's a story that's, that's not unknown to me. My own brother was bullied when he was in high school, um, back when we were living in a small town in Utah. And so it's a story that's, that's very personal to me, and it's, it's one that I think, you know, people, people want to tell their stories. They want to make sure that other people know that, that they're not alone. And so I've heard, I've heard stories uh, from, from lots of different people, people who are maybe short, people who have a disability, mm -hmm. and maybe that's the reason why uh, the person decided to, to kind of single them out. But, um, you know, it, it's been people who have been bullied across the board. Yeah, I find that to be true. It's really interesting because I have a nephew who, um, who, you know, gets bullied. And he um, is mentally challenged and has difficulties, obviously, being able to have the social skills. So he is in a special school, but it's still connected to the main um, public school district. And, mm -hmm. and they're kind of like almost fenced off in a way, but he gets scared because they, he sees these kids talking about him. And, you know, he looks a little bit different. And um, he's so fragile as it is, you know, that it's, it gets... So he gets filled with so much anxiety that he has to get on medication. And, and right. it's, that, that's really heartbreaking because, you know, we never know the severity behind the results of people being mean um, to one another. I had a, a privilege just the other day um, being able to uh, take care of these kids at a recess. And it was at a Montessori school, and I actually got a chance to break up a fight. And this boy, you know, he, uh, he tossed out the, the other little boy's ball from, from his hands, and uh, the boy got upset. And it seems like communication is a huge part of this, where people need to learn how to communicate right before he got punched in the face. I was able to go in there and say, well, maybe it was because he wanted to play with the ball. And I asked him, I said, did you want to play with the ball? And he said, yes. So, you know, it's, I, I feel like communication is important when it comes to having to understand the differences with people. Because we're all the same, but just a little bit different. And, and in that uniqueness, we, we should be able to appreciate and celebrate each other. What do you think, Nicole? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's ab absolutely right. We should obviously be cherishing our differences. But I also think um, one of the things that I'm looking forward to bringing to the table in this discussion um, throughout, throughout my time in working on this initiative is really helping educators, parents, 
develop a better understanding about what bullying is and what bullying is not because um, there's a lot of things going on out there in the community, a lot of, a lot of really good things. But what I want to bring to the table is focusing our energies because this is such a, a serious problem. When mm-hmm. you're being affected by it, it is such a serious problem. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that our time is spent on focus um, and focusing on the things that are going to be most efficient and effective in dealing with this problem because it is such a serious problem. And I know that Brad can probably um, speak to what he's seen in his research as far as what the most effective things are um, in helping to stop bullying. Well, can you tell us, Brad, what exactly... a resource. Right. Brad, can you tell us exactly what... um what bullying really means? Because I know there's all kinds of different ideas of what somebody might think what bullying is, but your, in your studies and the research that you've done, what are we talking about here? Yeah, it's, uh, it's important to understand that there are many different kinds of conflicts that people can have um, in school or away from school. And understanding the dynamics of them is important because when we understand why they're occurring, then we can kind of craft initiatives and solutions to help prevent them. So bullying is very particular. Uh, bullying, there's a couple hallmarks that define what bullying is. And one of them is an imbalance of power. Mm-hmm. So there right. is an imbalance of power that exists between the bully and the victim that doesn't exist in a standard kind of interpersonal conflict that may exist between two classmates, for example. So that's one of the hallmarks that separates bullying from something else. The other is that it's repeated. So a a single act, um, by definition, is not bullying. Uh, The bullying is something that happens again and again and again. Finally, kind of the, the definition of bullying involves what the intention is. And it is the intent of the bully to change victim get the victim to do something that he or she would not otherwise do. Surrender their lunch money, sit at a different table at lunchtime, take a different path to school, not go to recess. These are all the end goals for the bully. Wow. And what what does that do to the victim? You know, it it can do a lot of different things. Uh, You know, we've seen some very public and very tragic cases where young people who didn't have resources, didn't have access to help, really internalized what was happening to them and um, decided that, you know, that they would hurt themselves. That is obviously very extreme and very rare. Um, But in typical cases, we see that victims often do internalize what's happening to them by the bully. And this manifests in physical symptoms. Victims will often have these very vague illness symptoms, headaches, stomach aches, that look to be very, very real because they're experiencing them in a very real way. They miss a lot of school. They sometimes use the illness as a way to miss school. Um, In worst case scenarios, and the thing that I think I worry about most is when the thing that the bully is picking on them for, the victim begins to believe that they actually deserve the treatment. Um, And that's what I think is most tragic. Mm -hmm. Wow. Does that have anything to do with self-worth on the victim's part? And how um, how do parents interplay in all of this? on both sides of, of, you know, of the table here? I mean, it, it, are we seeing a, a, an abusive, um, re, you know, parenting uh, skills? How is that, does your research show any information regarding that? Well, I think there are two answers to that. The, the first is that, you know, parents play a large role in the lives of all children, of course. And there is a third member of this bullying dynamic that we often fail to talk about. We, we tend to focus on the bully and we tend to focus on the victim. And I'll, I know I'll let Nicole chime in on this in a second, but there, there's the third piece of the dynamic is there's always somebody watching. There's a bystander. And that bystander plays a very important role, a critical role 
in what schools can do and other institutions can do. Nicole, do you want to speak on that? Yeah, I do. I think that one of the things that research has shown and, and what we'll be working on um, in, in any initiative that I'm involved in with regard to bullying is trying to really in, entice and empower bystanders and encourage them, and, and not just encourage them, but to explain to bystanders that the right thing to do and the thing that they should be doing as they see these bullying incidents occur is to report it. Report it to someone in authority, report it to a parent, report it to a, a member of the school faculty. Because um, as I've learned from Brad and Brad's research, um, lots of times kids that are bullied are really invisible to the school. They're invisible to the adults who should be you know, looking out for their well-being during the time they're in school. And so it's very critical that any kind of efforts that are made in terms of trying to, to stop bullying really focus on this group that Brad's talking about, these bystanders who see bullying going on and don't do anything to stop it. And does it get to a point where, um, are we seeing something where some of these victims are not really reporting this because, you know, it seems kind of like typical. It's, you know, we kind of feel a lot of times it's one of those school things. And children have a tendency to have a school life and a family life. And um, a lot of times those two <coughs> things are very separate. And, uh, you know, having a child, a 15-year-old boy, it's, it's, it's amazing to find out some of the things that happens at school. And a lot of times, you know, we don't re really know about it until after the matter, after the fact. How open right. are I, these victims? Well, I, I, think, I think that's very true. And, and Brad, Brad can probably weigh in maybe on how, you know, how much parents kind of know what's going on in their kids' lives. But what I would, what I would add here is that, you know, during this last legislative session, I worked on some legislation that would have required parents to be notified if their child was being bullied so that they would know what's going on at the school. That was one component of legislation that was attempted to be passed with regard to an anti-bullying effort. And, and unfortunately, that legislation was not successful, but it will be a part of uh, legislation that I, that I work on again next year because I think it's very important that parents know what's going on because, mm -hmm. as Brad mentioned, in very rare, very extreme cases, but cases that, you know, if, if it's your child who's being bullied and, and goes inside of themselves because of that, um, you know, losing one child to a suicide is one child too many. And so um, we can't afford to not have a responsible adult in that child's life not know what's going on with their child during those hours at school when, you know, usually they don't know what's going on. If I might uh, jump in here real quick, um, Nicole, Brad, I appreciate you coming on. This is Joe, the owner of KQCK Radio Station, and again, I thank you for coming on here. I do have a question for our listeners and, and people watching the show um, regarding where can they get information on what this, what school districts are the best, and you know where they should direct, obviously their entire life to across Arizona. Do you do you have any idea, Maricopa, Pinal County, where I might be able to get info like that, or? Well, if, if you're talking about uh, kind of resources to help if, they're, if they know that their child's being bullied or, or, you know, kind of an awareness campaign, unfortunately, at least in, in my experience over the past several months of working on this, there's really not one place to go or kind of one-stop shopping for parents if they're trying to deal and get their arms around an issue like this. And so that's one of the things that I'll actually be doing is that we're going to set up a website for Arizona called stopazbullying.org. We've already reserved the website, and it will be a place where parents, educators, students can go to get the help that they need to get information about bullying and to really find those resources that can be so critical for them. But right now, I'm not aware of any. Gotcha. I think that... Go ahead, Joan. Sorry. No, I was just going to say where, uh, where our children go is uh, Florence Unified School District. And I know they have an anti-bullying club, 
Mm-hmm. And you know, I I know that they're trying on that. It's it's and, and policy, right? Right. It, un, they, un, they, unfortunately, the info you hear most, do. most schools do. Yeah, nowadays. They, right. They talk about the issues. The problem is that I have found, and this is Marie, by the way. Hi. Um, my kids have faced where there has been incidents where kids are are bullying them for different things, um, for their talents, or because you know how you're saying they're short or what have you. And the problem is the kids don't want to report it that are being bullied because they feel that uh, that they're narking and they're going to get bullied even more, mm-hmm. you know, because they're telling, you know, what's going on. And then, of course, if you tell your folks, the folks are, you know, going to get upset because they want to protect their child. They go to the school and they tell them what's going on. And, and then they say, oh, okay, well, we'll take a look at it and, you know, make sure everything's okay. And then they call the kids in, then they have a meeting and they find out, oh, okay, what's going on? What's, what's the issue? What's the problem? And then what happens is, you know, it might be resolved at that point, but then the kids have to deal with it because then they, the, the other kids tell some of the other kids, hey, well, Your they friends. narked on me right. and, oh, you know, so it's, it's like they don't, the kids that are being bullied don't want to say anything. They're afraid. That, that's consistent with the research that we see. I mean, the kids that are being bullied are not the ones that we should rely on to have to defend themselves. So, that's why so want to engage bystanders. So, how do you get the schools to to give up that? You know, hundred uh, percent. You know, we have a no bullying hundred percent. We haven't had any fights this year or anything like that. How do we get the, t- the the schools to be real and jump in on the bullying cases? Mm-hmm. At the schools, I think that's really where it sits, and that's the hardest part is to begin with the supervision taking care of the bullies because they see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's there's two things, Joe. The first is that you know I I wouldn't be so quick to say that the schools see the bullying. They might hear reported, and you know they might have you know conscientious parents coming to them. But what we know about bullying, kind of nationwide is that it's often very invisible to the schools. Bullies are very good about picking victims that don't have access to resources. In other words, they don't, they don't have a big support system with peers, and they are kind of invisible to staff and faculty at schools. And huh. also bullies are very good about, about choosing to act in places that are invisible on school grounds places that staff and faculty don't see Mm -hmm. like like the internet like facebook i've seen that firsthand where some of the kids are you know lashing out at some of the other kids oh you're this you're that and but you know unfortunately unfortunately and i know this is true across the state it boils down to the politics if you have a great superintendent i think it's going to make a tremendous difference the politics of it coming back to the superintendent though and nailing you is huge so. Well, and and this is Nicole weighing in again. I I think that some of the more effective programs that we have seen and that we hope to highlight um, at a summit later this fall are programs that, as Brad was talking about, really do engage bystanders. And some of the, you know, one of the programs that I've been impressed about that I've heard about is at a, a middle school called Shea Middle School where the students themselves took it upon themselves to create their own anti-bullying program within their school. And I think that whenever you can engage students like that so that it's organic and that it grows from the students themselves and that they say, we are not going to tolerate this in our school, we're going to do something about it ourselves, I think that's going to be much more effective Mm -hmm. at eradicating this problem than having it come from the top down. Um, and being told, you know, this is the way you're going to behave, this is what you're going to do. I certainly think that you need leadership within the school, but you also need to, we all need to understand that these students, they listen to each other probably more than they listen to the grown-ups, unfortunately. Sure. And so I think that that's, that's one of the best places that we can start. That is really fantastic. That, mm-hmm. that, is, that, is, that. that is awesome. And you know, you should grab a few of those kids. And, right. Instill it into the children. And, and give them a classroom <laughs> credit to go around and speak to other schools. Man, that right, is really great. That's very great. true. It's very true. I saw on the oh. news the other day where they had um, a dance for an anti-bully type of a, a dance after school. Do things like that work? Does that 
stimulate and, and rally up the kids to want to do something like that? You know, I, I think that the student-led initiatives, as Nicole mentioned, can be very effective because the students that are actually involved in these more innovative initiatives are the bystanders. They aren't, obviously they're not bullies and they tend not to be victims. So they're deciding to open their eyes to what's going on around them. But I want to go back to something that Joe mentioned earlier. He was talking about um, that the, you know, there are people that didn't want to come forward and that they were, there were schools bragging about it being a, a no bullying zone and you know, zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that when the schools started to react to all of the bullying that was in the media, they did their best to come up with policies and initiatives that they thought was, were going to really correct this problem. And a lot of schools were quick to adopt this zero tolerance, three strikes you're out approach to stopping bullying, mm -hmm. and it backfired. Because mm -hmm. bystanders didn't think that the punishment was equal to the crime in this case. So a bystander that otherwise would report bullying or would stand up for a victim was saying, well, I think the bullying is wrong, I know it's wrong, but I don't want to see the kid get kicked out of school. That just seems wrong. That seems to be too much. Something else should happen to him, but I'm not going to be responsible for this kid getting kicked out or suspended. So these three strikes or zero tolerance policies really kind of backfired. And something else that, that was mentioned is the, the process of bringing the bully and the victim together. That's a no-no. Mm -hmm. That should never be done. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the processes and one of the policies that some schools initiated in response to bullying was this kind of mediation between bullies and victims. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about what mediation is, in mediation, both sides agree to come together and give up a little something, you know, try to understand the other person. But in the bullying dynamic, the victim has nothing to give up. The victim did nothing wrong. What are they going to admit to? What sort of agreement are they going to reach with the bully? There isn't one. So this mediation ended up victimizing victims further. Mm -hmm. So schools are still learning what works. And I think that's what's so exciting about what Cole is doing for our state, is really getting together uh, in one location a set of resources that any schools can, can access and policies they can adopt. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's much needed at this time as well. Amazing. It's, it's really wild to, uh, to realize that something like this is uh, still pretty prevalent in, in the entire nation. And my other question in regards to, I hear what you're saying about the Shea School. I'm wondering if anything in regards to um, economic status, have your, or, and um, has your research shown anything in regards to there's a higher rate in this area versus this area, and perhaps putting more attention and more programs um, in those areas that need more uh, um, help and assistance. Boy, you know, we, we've seen that there are certain populations of kids that get bullied disproportionately. Mm -hmm. um, the LBGT community, uh, disabled students, two groups that you know, you've already mentioned, um, do seem to get bullied disproportionately, but nothing that I've seen indicates that there is any sort of you know, economic link to bullying. Uh, you can be bullied or be a bully and come from many different backgrounds. Uh, there are some key, there are some similar characteristics among all bullies, and there are equally similar characteristics among all kind of traditional victims. Um, that are that are not related to socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, bullies bullies tend to spend a lot of time alone. Um, I mentioned that victims don't have great support systems and that they don't have large peer groups um, and they don't have access to adults. Well, it turns out that bullies don't either. They spend a lot of time alone. And the best that we can figure out from studying them um, they aren't very good at their own interpersonal relationships. They, they don't know how to have relationships. They don't know how to have friends. So that's a characteristic that all bullies share. Do you also find that perhaps um, <clears throat> they play more video games or, and 
does that have any play in um, the violence, the stimulation of the violence? Does that sense to uh, desensitize them? Um, how does that work? <clears throat> You know, it, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one because there have been some really compelling studies that show that immediately after playing a violent or incredibly um, fast-paced video game, that people who play those games immediately afterwards have a, have a difficult time concentrating, focusing on tasks, um, and they may be prone to mimic some of the behaviors that they see but there's nothing to indicate that that actually lasts, that that would kind of bleed into um, their school day or into their interactions hours after that happened. If you look at, for example, the amount of time that kids spend playing video games has really increased over the last two decades. For sure. But actually school-based violence has gone down in that same period. Hmm. Wow. You know, I, I have seen that some of the children that do bully are not really uh, loners, but they're more of kind of like the leaders of the groups. Um, from from what I've seen with my kids at their schools, you know, these are the kids that are s somewhat, you know, quote unquote popular and and they have all the other kids that kind of band with them and they they kind of bully some of the other kids that are less fortunate or, you know, don't have the cool clothes or don't have the cool shoes and, you know, that sort of thing. Right. I know, I know that Brad's going to jump in on this one because I think that uh, the research has shown that the bullies tend to be kids who, although they may give off that appearance, tend to be people who are, you know, deep down very insecure and uh, very, you know, they're they're almost putting on this character of being the the confident leader, but but inside there's something very different going on. If I'm if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, right, Brad? Yeah, you know, it, they sometimes will have access to a group, and that group will give them that imbalance of power that I mentioned is one of the hallmarks of bullying. But when you look at when you look closer at those bullies, the real friendships in that group, well, they they just don't exist. Um, it, it seems that one of the things that bully they use the the bullying dynamic to to try to create relationships with those bystanders, but the bystanders tell us that they really aren't friends with that bully. Would you say that uh, would you say that charter schools, being that they have implemented a lot of them have Im implemented the uniforms that take that that curves a great deal of the aggressiveness in the bullying and that cuts it down quite a bit. And do you think across Arizona, the public schools would be a heck of a lot better if all the kids had some type of, of uniform they would wear? Well, you know, um, Nicole and I both had the pleasure of being with. Uh, Piper Charitable Trust this past week as mm. they gave grants to schools to buy clothes and uniforms for their students. And uh, I think that it's a, it's a tremendous gift to those students and to those families not to have to think about the status associated with clothing as mm -hmm. they send their kids to school. Um, I, I, th I think it's a tremendous service that Piper's doing. Um, and I've always been a fan of school uniforms. So I, I I'm not aware of the, any direct um, research about the impact of school uniforms on bullying. I think any time you have, what I do know is that any time you have a more engaged staff and faculty at the school that have better relationships with the students, that know the students, and, um, and the students know that that staff and faculty care about them, that you have less violence across the board, mm -hmm. not just bullying, but you have less violent incidents, period. Hmm. Well, and I, I also think that school uniforms, you know, inherently attempt to provide a leveling factor in terms of, you know, everybody looks the same, there's nobody wearing designer, you know, clothing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, and I only have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, so they're not really there yet, but as I understand it, even within schools that have uniforms, um, the student, some of the students will, they'll find ways to distinguish themselves and, and create that 
uh, separation in socioeconomic status so that people know, you know, that, 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 that they do have that, that they have attained that status. They know how to accessorize, huh? Exactly. <laughs> they, they add the bling. Well, they're, they're kind of limited, though, uh, to, from what I've seen right. in but some I mean, of the I, charter I schools. You, I think you have, to do, you have to do what you can do, and I, I, I do think that uniforms do attempt to provide that, that leveling factor and that, um, you know, it takes away some of the distractions, certainly. Mm-hmm. You know, Maureen, when I was growing up, the number one status symbols were things like Ralph Lauren and Izod. Izod, and me too. Right, and and now when we talk to kids about what is the what their status symbol brands are, the status symbol brands are Apple, mm. and right, so they're we, electronics. It, it's not apparel anymore, mm. uh, so it's it's gotten to be a little bit different. And their phones, what type of phone do you have, as opposed exactly. to exactly? You know, yeah. I was amazed to find out that my fifth and sixth grade student uh, children that are students told me that. They are the only kids that didn't have a cell phone. I found that so hard to believe I could not grasp that. So I investigated it, and sure as heck, every kid in those schools have an elementary school. Mm-hmm. They carry cell phones. It, mm-hmm. it, it blew me away. Wow. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it's yeah. a trend that we're seeing, and it's, it's really interesting. We're not, uh, when we talk to educators, they're really frustrated by it because these electronics are so disruptive mm-hmm. in the learning environment. Um, they're being used to cheat. They, they're taking text. They're texting during class. And um, it's a real problem to teachers. Right. And as the teachers say to me, I mean, what, what is the big emergency? There's a school phone. If they need to access their parents, they can. So it, it's a problem, I think. And they should just ban them from from the during school period. Plus, because you have all the, they're distracted. Plus, right. you have all the cameras on all the phones. Right, and they they can which record, is a whole other issue. They can record uh, things that are going on in the classroom, and and uh, unfortunately, I've heard and seen some things that go on in the classroom, and it's quite disturbing. Um, I don't know this this bullying thing. I've seen a lot of the the kids that are bullying are kind of some of the teacher's favorites. So these kids take advantage of that, and they use that to their advantage. Like, I think that's a rare situation, well, Marie, honestly. Well, there's a couple of them that I have yeah, seen. Yeah, I think that's rare. Do you, do you all think that's rare? I mean, really? Yeah, because usually they're troublemakers, Yeah, right? Usually. I can't imagine this day of age a teacher there siding is, with a kid that's a bully. There are okay a that. lot of yeah. favorites out there, Joe, believe me. There, bullying comes in a lot of different shapes, and that doesn't necessarily surprise me. We, we know statistically nationwide that bullies tend to not do well academically. And so it's, it, it can, like I said, bullying can take on many different shapes. But statistically, a bully is somebody that doesn't do really well in school. The things that they're good at are not things that are valued by the school. Hmm. And that, that's typically why they're you know, lashing out and, and taking advantage of, of someone who they have identified as weaker. So with all this anti-bullying stuff that, uh, that you all are working on, I'm sure that's something that um, working with the staff, the teachers, and you know, <laughs> for them to recognize this. What, what I totally do not understand is in the 80s, if you didn't have a pocket knife in your 4-H class in agriculture, you were an idiot. Now if you, you bring a knife to school... You're going to jail. I mean, what, how have we progressed to this? Well, without... I, I mean, is it the computers or what is it? I don't know. Well, you have all these you cases hear, I of hear people. A pin, could hear a pin drop I know <laughs> the cases of kids taking, you know, uh, taking like uh, what uh, these guns that that shoot like the um, uh, what what are those ones that they shoot like paintballs and stuff like that? Oh, you maybe know, I, they, right, right. I mean, uh, maybe I just grew I, up I, in this little bubble. I don't know. No. Well, no. But, you know, it's interesting, you know, Joe, is that schools in the 80s were more violent than they are now. Absolutely. For brief periods and, of time. Yeah. I mean. And so it's, uh, it made sense. We needed weapons back then. <laughs> I, I, you know what? Now they have cell phones. Just, just to survive, right? <laughs> and iPods. I have nightmares. I have nightmares of my senior year of high school on my lunch hour cleaning my 12-gauge to go dove hunting after school on the tailgate. I mean, now, holy cow, you know, you don't even want to drive by a school, you know, with a weapon. My God. Well, and I 
I think I, I actually, well, there, there's two examples here. Um, the movie Bully that came out maybe a month or so ago, um, it it's profiles five different stories of students affected by bullying or families affected by bullying. One of the, the profiles is of a little girl, I think she's 14 years old, who actually uh, takes a gun on a bus because she's being bullied and she's fearful for her safety and it chronicles what happens to her, um, you know, completely changes her life. She ends up in juvenile detention hmm. for an extended period of time away from her family. Um, that's profiled in the movie. I actually had a mother here in Phoenix reach out to me whose son um, was being bullied and physically assaulted the bully back. Wow. And he also um, is facing some problems with the legal system. So hmm. I think that you know, again, that's probably to be expected. I'm sure that um, it's the same thing as, as Brad will tell you. Bullying is not getting worse. Just as you mentioned, it was around in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are just examples of, you know, people taking their circumstances into their own hands. Right. You were bullied. Weren't you, Joe? Oh, yeah. When I you was, were a kid. I was an absolute. Yes. I was an absolute. I came from Massachusetts in third grade. And uh, right. I was, I, my parents moved into a, dominantly hispanic neighborhood in which i used to get chased home and beat up on a daily basis i was the epitome of the movie bully but i got them back <laughs> this, I got, this little I, kid with this accent i got the hispanics back <laughs> what'd you do i married a beautiful hispanic woman that's right <laughs> so i took one away from them you know what i mean <laughs> and you have half hispanic children <laughs> i still have reoccurring nightmares but yeah you, you know do. they're going away slowly being thrown in the trash uh, can and that sort of thing. Joe, what what ha did the did the bullying continue or did something happen that it stopped at some point? He took it, karate lessons. Well, yeah, that that helped. <laughs> but you know what? I was going to ask that. Does the victim <laughs> ever just stand up and just beat up the bully? You know, not you know what 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 happened to me was it, it got to the point. You know, my parents used to work, so I'd come home after school, and I'm talking you know third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Um, and it was towards the end of third, so you know I, I don't know if that makes any difference. But these kids just used to make fun of my accent. I was a little shorter, you know, than the other kids, and I was very white, like milky white, like glowing white. You know, I'd walk around like a light bulb, and um, it just, you know, after a little while, the fun it wasn't fun anymore, and they started taking my lunch money, then beating me up, full blown, like they were cool. Man, I tell you, I got a lot of good exercise though. I used to run pretty fast. <laughs> So what happened? You just like no, my up parents. No, my parents just you know they decided to move mm -hmm. after three years of that. So uh, you know it wasn't their fault, you know obviously, but we moved to a better area where I fit in better and knew exactly what not to do. Was there still Hispanics around? Well, you know, there's always Hispanics well, around. You know what I mean? No, it, it was a, it was a much more. It was a better area, right. but you know, bottom line. Right. But and, and that helped. With and with the new school, you were able to make friends and you were able to, you know, have companions at that new school. Most right? definitely. It was completely night and day, a light switch off and then on. You know, the past was completely forgotten. I was in a totally new environment on the other side of town and it was just fresh and I played it different. And that's, you know, you live and learn. So, so how were Which you? Go ahead, Brad. I'm sorry. Well, which is, it's why one of the more interesting interventions that we can do to help victims is help them connect with other students, help them find people at that school that they can be friends with, that share interests and um, share hobbies. And a lot of times what we find with victims, interestingly enough, is that they don't know how to make friends. You know, it, not everybody is equal in their ability to you know, obtain and maintain friendships. And so one of the things that we can do to help victims is help them connect, help them get that support system, because groups of kids don't get bullied the way that individuals do. So do you do that through kind of like a, a survey or a questionnaire with the kids, or do you have like a meeting or and talk with some of the kids and find out if they're having any of these issues that they can go and talk to somebody about this? You know, it, it, there. Once we know, like once the school knows that the bullying is occurring at that school, there's usually a counselor or some sort of health professional at that school that can be brought in to talk to the to the kid. Um, 
again, we never want it to seem like we're blaming the victim for the bullying, but it's often the case that the victim would really like some friends, um, but they just don't know how to relate to the to the students that are around them. And so sometimes it's you know it's the job of the counselor at that moment to give them ideas, role play. One of the things that I would when you're trying to teach a new behavior to a young person is is act it out. Role play what you're going to say to make a friend. This is also works really well when confronting a bully, too. It's a role play with the victim, what they're going to say in that instance. How are they going to appeal to bystanders? How are they going to get adults to, to jump in and help them out? So role playing with them, giving them some scripts to use in those situations can be very, very helpful. Uh -huh. Great advice, Brad. Thank you for that. Great advice. Do you have any um, preventative type of tips or even something that <clears throat> you might see in a child who might be getting um, bullied? Yeah. I mean, if you, are, if you are a parent and you've got uh, and your child is coming home with missing clothing, missing articles, missing um, possessions, with ripped or torn clothing and, and bruises that they don't want to talk about. Gum in their hair. Uh, Exactly. <laughs> That's not nice. Yeah, I know. Jeez. But, you yeah, know, the right. bus Hopefully, thing. When you yeah. go to take your, your child to school and you drop them off and you notice that, you know, where they used to walk to the right to get to the playground, now they're walking a very strange path from the car or the path that they used to take to school um, if they're walking to school from your home. They've all been taking, they're now taking a very circuitous route. Uh, these are those are that's another sign that mm -hmm. something's going on at that school that they're avoiding something. Has nothing to do with the vehicle you're driving at the time. How do, you know what? I, it I, might be the vehicle that you're <laughs> driving. <laughs> Again, it's not bullying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I can't help you. <laughs> how how did uh, how did you all come come about deciding you were gonna? Is this a campaign, or is this a what? What exactly are you? both doing i'm With sorry this to ask organization that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i mean I, I came to this um when my husband was elected mayor last fall i decided that um i guess similar to other wives of the mayor of phoenix who came before me um they had initiatives that they worked on and i decided that i wanted my initiative to be anti-bullying and so um, I think there's different levels of, of what you can do as the mayor's wife of Phoenix, and um, I there are a lot of things I want to be involved in here. Certainly on the advocacy front, I've already been down to the legislature um, regarding the safe schools or anti-bullying bill and going back to the legislature next session to try to make, it, make sure that it gets passed. Um, I'm working with Brad and my kitchen cabinet team that I've put together we're going to be hosting a summit later this year for educators that will be a full day of the type of information that Brad and I have been talking about um, to try to talk about best practices with regard to anti-bullying. And we'll be hosting that for probably 150 to 200 educators, as many as we can get. And then um, we're going to be doing a phone bank with Univision later this year um, in September, I believe it's September 6th, where we, where we will be responding to callers who call in. And there are a number of other things that I'm working on with regard to this is issue, the website for one. But um, I really want to do everything I can to make a difference on this issue. I don't want to start my own anti-bullying program. There are a lot of good programs out there. But my goal is to partner with groups that are doing good things in this area and really lift those programs up, bring attention to them, and highlight those resources for school districts. So, you know, it's, I guess you could call it a campaign, an initiative, um, just an effort to really make a difference in this area. Is that big summit or meeting that you're going to have that you're going to speak at to the educators, is that open to Pinal and Maricopa and pretty much any educators that want to go, or is it for the higher-ups? We are going to be sending it out to at least superintendents across the state. I think there's 200 and something school districts in Arizona. So um, we'll start there, and, and if we um, are able to work our way down to principals, assistant principals, and others, um, I want to reach as many people as we can. This will be the first. I'm sure that we will do others. 
and um, you know, I'd like to be able to have everybody there, but we only have space for about 200. Well, if we can, uh, you know, at KQCK radio station here, help you get the word out when you decide exactly what you have in mind, I would sure be happy to extend that. We do a lot of work with the public school system, so absolutely. If we can be of help, please uh, get get my contact info directly from Amy at -hmm. some point. Keep us in mind. I will, and we will send you information on exactly what we're doing. We have already started to put the content together, and I think it's going to be a very informative day. Sounds great. When is that going to be? When about? It will be in October. Um, We originally had it set for September, and then I um, was asked by the Phoenix Mercury to partner with them on an anti-bullying program that they're Mm -hmm. putting together on September 13th, and that was about the same time that our summit was planned, so we decided to bump the summit one month. So it'll be in the month of October. And when will the uh, website be fully running? As soon as Brad and I are able to get <laughs> to get the content on there, um, we have we have logo designed, we have the mm. website reserved, but it's a matter of, um, we, as I mentioned before, I think that there's a lot going on in the community. Lots of different groups are aware that this issue is very critical, mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of activity in this area. But we want to make sure that the information that's on that website really goes to best practices in this area because. You know, let's face it, students, teachers, their time in the classroom is limited, Mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that if we're putting information out there that we believe that it is information that's going to make an impact in this area and that we're not wasting the time of educators and and children. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Well, I applaud you, Nicole. I know you've received a lot of awards for everything that you've been doing lately, and I, honestly, it's well-deserved. And having someone like Brad, I, I would imagine it's only but a privilege. Yeah, I mean, Brad has uh, illuminated this issue for me in ways that, uh, you know, if you sit down with Brad for two hours and talk about this issue, he will entirely change the way you think about it, mm-hmm. all for the better. Oh, yes. And it's so promising to know that um, we have someone who actually cares. And it sounds like you both definitely do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean Brad's, a, Brad's a wonderful resource right here in our community. Mm-hmm. His, you know, he's with his own company. He's the president of his own company. And so I know that you know, this issue means a lot to him. Brad, what, what do you do, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, you know, um, I work for New Amsterdam Consulting. It's a it's a boutique research and consulting company here in Arizona, and we study kids. That's mm-hmm. all we do. Um, Brad, tell them the name of, of your things. web of your of your website, Brad, or your blog. Yes, please. My, my blog is I've been talking to your kids dot com, um, mm-hmm. which is what we do professionally. Uh, although when you say it out loud on the radio, it does sound a little creepy, and I mm. apologize for that. But <laughs> it is what we do. And do you, do so you have children? Them in interviews and focus groups, and and in the, and in large uh, quantitative surveys. Mm. Wow! Mm-hmm. Do you I've, have children, Brad? I do. Ah, great. Well, that sounds like your. That's definitely your line of work. I would have figured you for something like that. It's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, that, that's a good thing for sure. We appreciate you all coming on the show, most definitely. Yes, thank you thank so you much. Thank you for having us. It was a, definitely a great time having you on here and giving us some really important information. Um, thank you for the, the tips on how to be able to help the, our kids as well. Can you, can you go ahead and run them down one more time if people are looking for some help? Um, sure. Thank you. Well, right now, I would say, you know, it, uh, if you want more information about what bullying is, actually the federal government has, I think, the best collection of information and resources for parents, educators, and um, just interested community people at stopbullying.gov. Uh, we're, I borrow heavily from the research, and, and obviously and Nicole and I and the rest of the committee do, too. Um, Cartoon Network has some great resources that uh, will really that kids will respond to and will learn about effective strategies. And their program is called Stop Bullying, Speak Up, which you can get through CartoonNetwork.com. Uh, in the you know in the East Valley, if you've got a if you are a parent of a student of a child and 
who's really experiencing some mental health issues because they've been a victim of bullying or if you suspect that your child is a bully, uh, you've got a great resource in the East Valley with a new leaf. And their website is www.turnanewleaf.org. Hmm. Um, a wonderful, wonderful um, resource, and they've got counselors and counseling programs available for kids. Fabulous. And for those of you that just tuned in or tuned in late and want to re-check uh, out the show, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is KQCK Radio, or you can just jump on our website, kqcklive.com, and you can look up archived shows, and this will pull up. Well, thank you both again, Brad and Nicole, for being on uh, Random Affairs. And uh, anything else you guys want to talk about or mention? Uh, there's only one other thing that I would mention, and it's because it's coming right up. Next weekend, uh, May 12th, at the mm-hmm. Phoenix Art Museum, there will be two showings of, or two screenings of a movie called Bullied to Silence, and it actually profiles a couple of individuals here uh, in Arizona who were victims of bullying. And if you want more information about that, um, I would call the Phoenix Art Museum or um, I believe the organization is called GLSEN, G-L-S-E-N. And you can, I believe it's glsen.org. Fabulous. Good to know that they're being a part of this. All right. Well, hopefully uh, maybe down the line we can have you on again. <clears throat> And certainly, if uh, you know you get that info to us, we'll put it out there for everyone as well. I appreciate Thank that. You. All Thank right, you both well. for have, uh, for being on. All right, we'll have a wonderful we'll evening. Talk to you later. Thanks again. All right, bye-bye. bye bye. Bye. Well, our intimate time together has come to a close. Join us every other Sunday discussing random affairs with you. This is Ami Hazard saying, say to your truth, live your life with love and passion. Thank you for listening in. Buenas noches. Bonsoir. Arrivederci. Good night. Just